glad you're here. If you're online or you're in person, if you would stand to your feet, please. And uh, we're going to pray. We are going to worship. We're going to talk about worship in the teaching time. So I'll, I'll encourage you, my pastor used to say this, we're going to talk about worship and it's going to be a little bit convicting. So I'm warning you now in the time of worship to worship. <laughs> I'm encouraging you. Uh, we are going to enter into the presence of the Lord. So let's pray and invite him here. And then uh, we'll go from there. Let's pray. Father God. I right, just stop because it's amazing we can say, I can say that phrase, Father. You've adopted us, Lord. As was spoken to a couple weeks ago, Lord. You've adopted us at great cost. The greatest cost. And you're God. You are creator of the heavens and the earth. And you know us individually. And Lord, you know what's going on in our minds and our hearts right now. And you desire to commune with us, Lord. You desire to dwell with us. We invite you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We choose to surrender, to yield, to give up fighting, Lord, and let you do what you desire to do. Have your way in us today. Lord, we want to lift up your name because you are worthy of all praise. I pray that as we lift up our voices, as we might lift up our hands, as, Lord, our hearts are lifted to you, that you would receive it, Lord, and be blessed. Pour out your spirit in this place, Lord. Move in this place. I pray when we walk out the doors of this building, Lord, we would be different, not because of anything related to this church, but because we've been with you give you this time. We choose to worship now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together. Shout of what he's doing. 
this load on my soul. All that is within me, I will rise in His love. I will shout of what He's doing.
be his choir of angels this morning. Good morning. That was better that time. I was just seeing. How many of you had coffee? All right. Hi, you got it still. He's, he's working on it. I don't drink coffee on a regular basis, but when I do, uh, you'll know. Because <laughs> I'm like, I, uh, I was just thinking, this is not in my notes, so bear with me uh, on this. But I was just thinking... Uh, I, I went for the first time. Our oldest daughter is at Texas A&M at College Station, and I was telling a brother that we went to a football game. I went with my dad and my two brothers and my daughter and uh, some of her, her roommates, and uh, we were at the game, and I'm watching this thing go on. How many of you have been to a, a Texas A&M game? If you haven't, even if you're not a fan, it is like what church should be, except it's a football game. Minus a few things <laughs> that I won't mention. But I mean, it is, there's such a, a, a unity and they're like doing these chairs and people are like shoulder to shoulder and like they weren't following the COVID restrictions. I will assure you of that in the student section is where we were. But uh, there was uh, a unity and a passion. It is a little cultish, I have to say. And people are 
focused. And so I will pray we are as focused, as enthusiastic, but on the Lord completely uh, this morning. I have a few announcements uh, real quick that I want to mention. Evening at Bethlehem, which is a living nativity, is going to be drive through. I'm not even sure which way it goes. We'll, we're figuring all that out. They have it figured out, but we need some people to, to sign up. Um, we have some slots that need to be filled. It's two nights. It's drive through so you're at the scene, and the cars will go through the campus. We especially, last I heard, need some wise men, so if you are or you can act the part, um, you're invited. Um, you can stop shaving now, have a little beard, um, and uh, we also need some women, some men to help set up, clean up in different roles. We need some angels. We need some shepherds. We need a lot of things. The animals are, are hired, but the rest are volunteers. They, they get paid, or the people who own them get paid. Um, but Evening at Bethlehem is this Friday and Saturday. So if you're thinking of signing up, today's the day. There should be a table out there. You can email the office. Just let somebody know. We'll get you signed up for that. Um, there are cards out there, I believe. Um, you can share it online, digitally, through social media or otherwise. Evening at Bethlehem on one side. Once you be a part of that, bring somebody. Bring somebody who doesn't know the Lord. It's going to be awesome. It's not just uh, Jesus' birth. It's all the way through to his resurrection, and then we're going to present the gospel. We're going to give out Bibles to those who want to receive that and, and hand it into the window of their car. And then on the back side of that same card, if you pick up one of these, are the Christmas Eve services. Christmas Eve services, same as last year, 3, 4, 30, and 6. Uh, invite somebody to come. Uh, bring your family, your unsaved neighbors, co-workers. Uh, we would love to, to see them, to have them worship with us, to have them come to know Jesus. So uh, be a part of that. Last thing is, um, if you uh, desire to give, you can give online, one of the boxes. I just want to thank you again for being faithful in your giving. Uh, we've been able to, to meet all the obligations we have to be at budget thus far through this year and even a little bit above that. And so um, that's a huge blessing. We've been able to do more in supporting our missionaries because a lot of uh, the missionaries that we support have received less support this year. And we've been able to help some people uh, this year, beyond what we normally are able to do as far as benevolence, and that's been a huge blessing. We've had more requests as well. So as you're able to give, uh, I encourage you to do it as you feel led to give by the Lord. Uh, please do. And then the last thing I want to mention uh, as we come to the end of the year, if you're praying about where you might give end of year gifts, um, we are down under $70,000 on paying off the loan on the building. So I'm very excited about paying that off, praying that we can pay it off either the end of this year or early next year. So be praying about that. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. And then I'm going to pray as we jump into this. Lord, it was already prayed, but I pray it over myself. I pray that I would get out of the way sufficiently so that your word comes through. I pray anything that comes that's me, uh, from my thoughts would not be remembered, but everything that is your word would take root. Lord, I thank you for this passage. It's a challenging one, but it's good, as everything you do is good. Everything you say is good. So we give this time to you, and I pray we'd be changed today. In Jesus' name, amen. I have to confess something to you. I was... Uh, I had this moment of, of jealousy because I watched the, the teachings that were given. Pastor Dave did a great job last couple of weeks teaching on adoption, spiritual adoption, teaching on the power of the Holy Spirit. And I was like, man, those are awesome topics. And then I turned to the passage I was preparing for, and I get to preach on them worshiping a gold calf. And I thought, you know, that's really not fair. Lord, why do I get to teach on this? But I, I want to... Encourage you, don't check out. If you're watching online, keep watching because I was blessed, broken in some ways, and changed this week as I studied through this passage. I will tell you, it is something that I don't take for granted, I try not to, that I'm blessed to be able to spend hours every week as part of my job studying God's Word. Um, that is a, a huge privilege and we all get to study God's word, but it's part of my job, literally, and I love it. 
I love studying God's word. And this passage struck me in a couple of ways. The title I've given to the message is From Mountaintop to Valley Low. Moses was up on Mount Sinai. He had taken a few people with him. They had gone back down. He's up there, I was going to say by himself, but he's not by himself because he's encountering God. How long was he up there? 40 days and 40 nights. 40 is huge in scripture. Uh, I did a, a series of devotions probably five years ago on the 40s in scripture. And uh, we may bring that around and, and use it again because uh, there are a lot of 40s and they're meaningful in the scripture. At this point in uh, our study of Exodus, a lot of things have happened. God has done amazing things. He turned uh, this captivity into freedom. He, he brought the plagues. He turned bitter water into sweet water. He brought water from a rock. He went before them as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. He gave the Ten Commandments from a a mountain that was literally on fire. He's done all these amazing things. He parted the Red Sea, and they should have had an amazing respect for God at this point. They should have had an awe and a fear of God that would overwhelm them, that would cause them never to turn away. But we know the story. And we know the story personally, some of us, that God can do an amazing thing in your life, but a little way ways down the road, maybe 40 days, maybe 40 minutes, maybe 40 years down the road, we can be pulled to the left or the right. We can be distracted. They should have had a healthy fear of God. And if they would have, it would have been safety to them. Scripture says a couple things about fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. But it also says, the fear of man brings a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of man is a snare. And I want to build off of that contrast as we see it come through in this passage. See, we've shifted scenes. We had... Moses up on the mountain, getting all of the law that we've been studying, learning the fear of the Lord. He's up on this mountain that's literally on fire. But now we shift scenes down to the valley. And here's the thing about mountaintop experiences. They end. They always end. And I've said this before, if you stayed on the mountaintop, how many of you have had a mountaintop experience? It's not a negative, it's a good thing. How many of you have had one? An experience of God, maybe, you know, in Texas there aren't a lot of mountains, but, you know, a mountaintop experience where you, maybe you went to somewhere in nature, maybe you're by yourself, maybe you're just studying your word, maybe God did a miracle in your life, and you're like, this is it, God, I'm never going to leave this moment, I'm just going to stay in your presence forever, I want to, but it ends, And you have to go down the mountain into the valley. And here's the problem with going down in the valley. There are people there. They're always there. Some some of you, some of us have been that people. Have you ever ruined somebody's mountaintop experience? I have. Somebody comes there like, God is so awesome. I'm like, yeah, um, I didn't tell you what happened while you were gone at the women's retreat. (laughs) I'm not going to tell that story. It ends. We're up on the mountain, but we go down into the valley eventually. And there's a snare of people down in the valley. We're going to talk about the fear of man because I think it's at the core of why they worshiped a golden calf. Because Aaron had been left in charge. Who is Aaron to Moses? His older brother, yeah, his brother. And who did he become in the nation of Israel? What was his role? Yeah, he was the high priest. Now, I want you to think about that while we read what he did. Because you want to see grace and mercy. This is grace and mercy that this guy is going to be high priest even after all this mess. Verse 1, Exodus 32. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. 
For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. I'm thinking that they were of the mind that Moses was dead. If you knew your leader went up to the top of a volcano and he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights, you might think they were dead too. The mountain's on fire and they've not heard anything for a while. They're thinking he's dead. Not to mention they aren't so excited about the law they were already given, even though they agreed to do it, to live it. And so they come to Aaron. We don't know what's become of your brother. And Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Seems like he has this planned out pretty quick, doesn't it? So all the people broke off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool. Wait till he gets to explaining this in the next part. We won't get to it this week. Um, it's, it's funny. It, it's funny and sad at the same time. It made a molded calf. Then they said, they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. It's crazy. They're looking at a golden calf saying, this is your God. This brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, now this is interesting to me, the language here. He made it, but when he saw it, when he got all the accolades, when they started chanting and cheering, he built an altar before it. So he builds an idol, then he builds an altar before the idol. They're about to give sacrifices before this idol. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. To Yahweh, Jehovah. I said this when we were studying the commandments about having no other God and then the commandment about having no carved images. They didn't just say, hey, we're going to abandon God. We're going to do our own thing. We're going to worship other gods. I don't believe that's what's going on here. They wanted to worship God in their own way. They wanted a representation of God to worship. They wanted a God they could touch and feel up close. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. They're not playing football, by the way. We'll come back to that. Not football, to what it really means. The fear of man is a very dangerous thing. Moses was up on that mountain 40 days and 40 nights, learning the fear of the Lord. They were down becoming restless. The people were in the valley. They didn't know what was coming next, and they were restless. They were separated from everything they knew. Now remember, for generations, for 400 years, they were slaves. Where? Not a trick question. Egypt. They're in Egypt. They knew how the Egyptians worshiped. They knew how things were in Egypt. Now they're, they're in a foreign territory, not yet in the promised land, and they're wandering, and they're uncomfortable because they're separated from what's familiar. Not only that, they've been separated from the one that's been leading them for a while in Moses, and they think he's probably dead. It's really not that long. 40 days to make a covenant with God and then to break it in every way possible. It was long for the people, short for Moses, because he's in the presence of the Lord. Waiting is often a challenge for us. Does anybody in here besides me struggle with waiting? Anybody? The rest of you are good at it? We don't like to wait. We don't like to wait, especially when we can't see what God's doing. When we're called to walk by faith and not by sight. Waiting's hard. When we do wait, it's a good thing. Scripture says it this way. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God wants to bless us in the waiting, but we struggle to wait. 
especially when we can't see. They went back to what was familiar. What about us? What about us? This has been a challenging year for a lot of people. Would you agree with that? Really challenging. And I think way too many of us do what the scripture warns against. The scripture says, a dog returns to its own vomit. Remember, I invited my brother to come teach, my older brother, to come teach my small group when I was young in college. And he came and he preached on that. Dog returns to its own vomit. And the pig, you know, wallow in the mud. Actually, the dog returns to its own vomit is in the Hebrew scriptures and in the New Testament. Just to make sure we know it's a dangerous thing. And I, I know from experience, not being a dog, but watching my dog, it's true. And they not only return to their own vomit, they return to another dog's vomit. And you're like, why are you talking about this? It's gross. Because we do the same thing spiritually. When we get restless, when things are difficult, when God disappoints us, when we're crying out to God to heal our family member, to help us get through a financial hardship, to, to change the circumstance in the world, in our country, to have an election go this way or that way, and it goes differently than you might want it to go, or something doesn't change that you want to change. Sometimes we go back to what's familiar, even if it's gross. I'm not going to ask you to answer, but I want you to think about it. How many of you, how many of us have gone back to something familiar in the midst of waiting on the Lord in this season? I'm looking at everybody, so I don't look at anybody in particular. But we do. We go back to what's familiar, and that's what they did. They knew about idols. Remember, this is a, this is a group that's mostly... Jewish people, but it's a mixed multitude with them. So there's Egyptians, there's people from other nations that have been enslaved by Egypt. And they knew idols, and they go back to those idols because they were tired of waiting 40 days, and they're already tired of waiting on God. Waiting is hard. I've used the illustration before, but I was reminded of it. My daughter's home from college for a little bit, and and I remember when she was about a year and a half old, not quite two, and we told her that she was going to have a baby brother or a baby sister. She was so excited for like a week. And then she thought we were liars. Because eight months for a year and a half year, year old is forever. And some of us need to grow spiritually beyond being a one and a half year old. Because if you want to know how mature you are, how spiritually mature we are, see how you handle waiting on the Lord when you can't see anything that he's doing. That's when you find out. I always feel spiritually mature when I'm on the mountaintop. But when you go down in the valley, it's a little different. So what do they do? They go to Aaron. They're like, Aaron, we don't know what happened to Moses. I mean, he went up there, but we're counting on you. I mean, I don't know what they're singing, but, you know, maybe it's like Aaron, Aaron, he's our man. If he can't do it, nobody can. Come on, Aaron, you can do it. Maybe you can help us out. Make us a gold calf. Remember the, remember the statues that we used to see them worshiping and that we worshiped and some of us are carrying on our pockets. We, we, uh, we want an idol, something to touch, something to feel, something that we can send before us to worship God. You know, it's a picture of strength. Moses is gone, but Aaron, you can help us out with this. And if you want to talk about peer pressure, let me ask this. Has anybody in here ever had thousands of people? How about even millions of people pushing you to do a certain thing all at the same time personally? I mean, that's a lot of pressure. And he gives in. See, Aaron has a flaw, and it would have been a fatal flaw if it weren't for intervention. Moses later says, and the Lord was very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him. So I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. 
we'll get to that. When Moses prayed, it was to hold back God's judgment. Aaron feared man. When I say that, I'm using a phrase, but you know I don't mean just men. He feared women, people, the crowd. He, he was giving in to that peer pressure. He wanted to please. Happens in ministry all the time where there's pressure to go in the direction that people want, even if you believe, I believe that God has clearly spoken something. The fear of man. They wanted a God up close, an idol. An idol is anything that takes God's place in your life. It can be a person. It can be a thing. It can be a thought. It can even be a feeling. Like, I want that feeling so bad that I'm going to do whatever it takes to have that feeling. Calvin said this. He said, our hearts are idol factories. Our hearts will come up with something to idolize. They didn't so much want to abandon worship of Yahweh. They wanted to worship God the way they chose. More like the Egyptians. And yet, let me remind us all what they had agreed to in a list of many other things. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord God, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Don't worship idols. Don't make images. An image takes away from the glory of God. We have to worship God how? In spirit and in truth. Why in spirit? Because he's spirit. God is spirit. You cannot worship God in the flesh. But they did. They tried. Why did they choose a bull? It says in most translations, the calf, but the Hebrew can mean up to like a three-year-old bull. Why did they worship a bull? It's not rhetorical. I'm curious what you think. Yeah. Say again. Yeah, both. Because bulls are a symbol of strength. And they worship bulls in Egypt. We talked about it. This, this uh, carving that, that they found, it's one of the pharaohs worshiping Apis, this false god that they believed was a source of strength. They worshiped, they went back to their vomit. They went back to where they had been. They went back to what was familiar because they were doubting. They couldn't see what God was doing. And they worshiped this idol. Thinking they're going to worship God through the idol, they worshiped an idol. How did they make the idol? How did they make it? Yeah, they took all this jewelry. They sacrificed. They were Here's the thing about idols. When we have idols, we will be extremely generous towards our idols. We will give and sacrifice and work for our idols. We will spend more money on something we idolize than we would ever think we would spend. And I'll say this, if you're spending more money, more time, more thought process going to anything other than the Lord, watch out. Say, no, 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 I would never give anything more time than I give to God. Even if you're giving time that belongs to God to something else, when he deserves it, it becomes an idol. Watch out. What is that for you? What pulls you? What draws you? 
What do you sacrifice for rather than sacrificing and giving something to God? Aaron, for his part, he planned it, he gathered it, he melted it, he molded it, he fashioned it, but none of it, none of what he was doing, none of it was anointed by the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, why do you mention that? Because Bezalel and, and Aholiab, we saw in, back in, in chapter 31, they were anointed by God to shape the things for the tabernacle, to make them. None of this was led by God. None of it. It was rebellion. The fear of man. Going back to the familiar. And they said, this is your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. This is your God. This gold calf brought you out. It's crazy. And any godly leader would have shut it down, but Moses was up on the mountain and Aaron was afraid of the people. He was scared. He said, but we would never do that, right? We would never find ourselves in this place. But how often, I want you to really think about this, how often do we worship God the way we want to worship God? Not because he told us to, but because we just chose to do it that way. Because we like it better. You might call it being seeker sensitive. Or you might call it contextualization. But if it's not grounded and founded in the fear of God, don't do it. We don't get to choose how we worship. God lays it out. And I think there are a lot of leaders, pastors, Christians who are trying to lead as many people as they possibly can into the presence of the Lord. But what they're really doing is leading more and more people to a golden calf. Because God will be worshiped in spirit and in truth and no other way. Just because more people are going in a direction doesn't mean it's a good thing. Anything. that takes away from God's glory, that isn't grounded in spirit and truth worship, is an idol. Do you remember what they promised? Do you remember what they promised the children of Israel back in chapter 24? This is what they promised. He gave them the whole law, gave them the Ten Commandments. So Moses came and told all the people the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do, but they didn't. They said they were going to do it. How many times have I done the same thing? How many times have you done the same thing? God, I'm, I'm going to keep your, your word. I'm going to do it this time. This time's different. Following the crowd is usually going against God's direction. It is rare that when you follow the crowd, you're following the Lord. Aaron is flattered. He's made this golden calf. They're all cheering, you know, Aaron, Aaron, he's our man. And, and he sees it. And he not only is pleased with it, he builds an altar in front of the idol. They not only made a golden calf, they worshiped it. They burnt offerings before it. They sacrificed to it, all led by the one who ultimately would be the high priest. It's crazy. And then he says, let's have a feast to Yahweh while they're looking at this golden calf. They're worshiping the true God in a false way. And did you notice it says a couple interesting things. It says they rose early. The thing that you idolize, you'll wake up early for. If it really matters to you, you won't miss it. I've told you the story of my friend Kevin and I, Kevin Chow, and we were good friends. Uh, he was my best friend while I was in seminary, and we used to go fishing together because we both liked to fish, and 
And uh, I remember the first time we went fishing, got up at like four in the morning as we had to drive up into the mountains to this lake. We were going to go to the San Gabriel Mountains right behind uh, Pasadena there. And we got up early, early in the morning, and I come out and I see this stream of people walking down the sidewalk from the seminary housing. And I said, what's going on? Is there some event I didn't hear about? He said, no. He says, those are the Korean students. We had a lot of Korean students at Fuller. He said, they're going to pray. I said, really? There's a prayer meeting today? He says, there's a prayer meeting for them every day. 4 a.m. every day. Why did I see him? Because I was going fishing. You know, I'm going to confess something to you that I think I've said before. The only time I saw those people at 4 in the morning was when I was going fishing. They rose early, and they rose to play. Sahak, sahak means sport or play, but here it has a connotation of sexual immorality. How do I know that? Because of context. If you don't think it can mean that, then jot down this verse, and you can read it on your own. Genesis 26, 8 and 9. In the King James, it says that, well, you can go read it on your own. Sexual immorality, they drink, they eat, and they commit all kinds of lewd acts. All in what started with worshiping God in their own way. From mountaintop to valley low, the fear of man will take you very, very low. What are our idols? What draws you? What way do you try to make worship your own way? And if you're doing it in any place in your life, watch out. Look at verse 7. Let me read this to you, 7 through 10. And the Lord said to Moses, go get down. Underline that. Go get down for your people. Did you catch that? Your people, Moses. (laughs) They're yours. In fact, he takes it further. Whom you brought out of the land of Egypt. Who brought them out of the land of Egypt? He's like, they're yours now. Have you ever done that? If you have children and you're angry with them and you're speaking to your spouse, you're like, your son. But when they're doing something good, you're like, my son. Go get down. For your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Then they they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. What does that mean? It's a farming term. When you pull with a rope on an ox and it won't respond. Now, therefore, let me alone. This is God speaking. Let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of you a great nation. Have you ever been so mad you just told people get away from you? Is that just me? You're like, get away. You just just want to burn with rage. You're so mad. You're like, just leave me alone. That's what God says here. He's like, I'm going to fry him. I'm done. He's angry. Why is he angry? Yeah. Because they worshiped an idol. Do you know that God never missed anything? you see how he recounted everything that happened exactly? Even the words they spoke. Why? Because God sees everything. Do you know there has never been a time where you confess sin that God went, are you serious? You did that? No, he's like, I know. I was there. I don't think God is, I know God is never surprised. It's not like when you go, I'm thinking there are times when people go into the Catholic church, and I've, I've been in one of those booths before. I had stuff to confess. I wasn't even Catholic, but it seemed like a good thing. I'm sure there are times the priest is on the other side of that, like, shade, and he's like, whoa. Oof. Maybe he's like, that's a new one. You know, I, you know, he's surprised, but God is never surprised. I was talking to, to Brian 
the youth pastor, and we were talking about those times where people share their testimony. Have you ever been, if you grew up in the church, you've heard it, where somebody tells this whole crazy story of sin in the third person at the end, and they say, and that man was me. And everyone goes, God never does that. He doesn't go, I had no idea. He knows it all. He knows it all. But let me tell you something. The sin was big to God. Idolatry is big to God. Psalm 106, I don't have it to put on the screen, but it says this. They made a calf in Horeb and worshiped the molded image. Thus they changed their glory into the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, awesome things by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said that, that he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he destroy them. Stephen talks about it before he's martyred. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Paul says it this way, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. I'm going to tell you something that I was convicted of again, not the first time, but again, we take sin way too lightly. You're like, oh, I don't do that. Yes, you do. You do just like I do. I was reminded as I was thinking about that thought of the man who came up to me around this time of year. It was actually right before Christmas some years ago. Some of you have heard this story before. And he hands me an envelope after the second service. We only had two services at the time. The second service, he hands me an envelope with my name on it. And because it had my name on it, I opened it up. And it had three checks, three tithe checks for three months, the three past months. Now, I never look at any of the checks. I don't know who gives, what they give, how much they give, whether they give or not. I never know that. But in this case, I did. And I opened it up, and these were pretty big checks. And then I found out that that guy, the next day, left his family, his wife, for another woman. And I remember thinking, why did he do that? But I called him up. I didn't have his number but I got his number and I called him up and he didn't have my number either. So he answered. I won't say his name. I said, what are you doing? And I will never forget what he said to me. He said, listen, Matt, I know it's wrong. I know it's wrong, but this time I'm going to follow my heart. And I, I'll be honest with you, you know, I didn't use any bad words, but I let him have it. I'm like, are you kidding me? You're leaving your wife and your family to go after some woman you met on social media? This is crazy. It's sin. He said, you know what? This is what I'm going to do. Sometimes we take sin lightly. We think, you know what? It'll be okay. God forgives, Right? God was angry here, really angry. He wants to burn them up. And some of you think, well, you know, God doesn't get angry like that anymore. God doesn't get angry like that. He covers our sin. We take sin too lightly and we forget all of the wrath, all of the judgment, all of the fire that we deserve was placed on Jesus Christ who took our place. Let me tell you, if you stood for one hour in front of the cross and watched Jesus suffer, you would never think that God takes sin lightly. I sure didn't think so when I watched the Passion of the Christ the first time. I was just like sitting in my seat. And the, the most difficult thing that Jesus endured wasn't the physical. And then the crazy thing that happens here, this is really crazy to me. He says to Moses, you know what? What if I just start over with you? Did you catch that? He says, 
Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and I will make of you a great nation. You can be the new Abraham. We'd have to change the song. Father Moses had many sons. Why didn't he take it? I'll tell you why I think. It doesn't say in the scripture. I think he didn't take it because he was humble. And one of the reasons he was humble is if you go back and remember, God wanted to kill Moses before. You remember? In Exodus 4, God met him on the road and said, I'm going to kill you. And if not for his wife, seemingly, he would have been dead. He remembered. And he realized And not only that, he loved these people. He had sacrificial love. We didn't even read it. We'll get to it when we get to the rest of the passage. But he literally said, I, God, save them. If you would blot me out of your book, send me to hell, but save them. Like Paul said, Moses says it here. God is angered by our sin, but Jesus took the punishment. Last piece of this passage. Um, I may not have time to say everything I want to say, but there's always next week. Verse 11. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought up? You catch that? He says, Moses, your people, you brought them up. Moses is like, no, 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 God, they're yours. They're yours, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel. Your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. It's a model for intercession. If you've never... Been strong as an intercessor. Go back to this prayer and the part that we're going to get to and see this model. This is a perfect model for intercession. Number one, he starts by being desperate. He's pleading with God. He's not saying, God, you know, whatever your will is, God, whatever you want to do. God's will will always be done. But he says, God, please don't kill him. Don't destroy him. God, I'm desperately crying out to you. When was the last time you prayed with desperation? called for God's grace. He in essence says, God, you haven't been dealing with us based on what we deserve up to now. You've been giving us grace and mercy. Don't stop. Don't stop showing grace and mercy. He's desperate. He's honest. He's like, God, if you do this, the Egyptians are going to say you're mean. You would be doing what we deserve, but, but God, please, is there another way? Do it for your name's sake. He's selfless. He says, they're your people, God. And I would rather be blotted out of the book than have them all perish. I want to get to where I pray like that for people. I'll be honest with you. Most of the time, I'm way too selfish. To say, God, send me to hell, but save them. I'd rather be separated from you and see all these people saved. The fervent prayer of a righteous man is powerful, availeth much. And what happened after he prayed? He relented. In the King James, it says he repented. It says God repented. In the New American Standard, which I really like, it says God changed his mind. Numbers 23 says this, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? 
seems like a contradiction. Let me tell you what I think, what I know is going on here. God is explaining God things in human terms. In uh, literary terms, it's called uh, anthropomorphism. God explain he, God things in human terms. Why does he just explain God things in God terms? Yeah, because we'd have no clue what he's talking about. We're not God. We would be totally lost. He explains in a way we can understand. God relented. God repented. God changed his mind only from our perspective. God knew what he was going to do. How do I know that? Because who told Moses to go down and see what was going on? God did. God knew everything. He was going to go, Moses, go down there. Because somebody needs to pray for these people or they'd be wiped out. God's will was done. Can we change the will of God through our prayers? No. Nothing changes the will of God. But I do believe we can, quote, unquote, shift the direction, quote, unquote, God shifted direction to build up an intercessor, to bring about his will in a way that nobody else could yet see. Moses didn't change God, but in a way, he changed the people standing before God. No longer under judgment, but under grace and mercy. Mercy and grace over judgment. God's purposes are unchanging. His will is always done. But God's purposes are also unfolding. As we seek him, we understand more. We see more. Go down and see Moses. God already knew what he was going to do, but he wanted Moses to see it so that he would cry out to God so that he could relent. God's purposes are unchanging, unfolding, and in a way that I can't fully explain to you, God's purposes are unleashed through prayer. From mountaintop to valley low to a desperate prayer lifted up that was heard in heaven. Are we more like Aaron, so afraid of, of what people might think, or are we willing, understanding the fear of the Lord, to cry out like Moses? If you're able to stand, I'm going to invite you to stand as we close. Let's pray. Father, Forgive me for fearing what people will think more than at times fearing you. Lord, forgive us for being more afraid of a virus, some, than of you. God, forgive us for taking sin lightly and thinking, well, I'm under grace. Thank you, Jesus, that you took our place. Every hair in your beard torn out, every stripe that you took, every punch that you took, every thorn into your head, Every spike in your body separated, forsaken for us. Lord, I pray that we would choose to live in the fear of God, that we would choose to live holy, set apart for you, Lord. And Lord, I pray you would give us a heart, give me a heart, Give us hearts of intercessors, Lord, crying out for those who are lost. Lord, we wouldn't be going back to our own junk, vomit. Lord, 
we be crying out to the living God on behalf of the people around us who are facing the judgment of fire. Lord, show us this week people who are lost. who are going to face fire in all eternity if they don't receive the truth of the gospel. We cry out on behalf of our community, of our families, of our nation, of this world. Lord, we need you to intervene, to show up. Lord, hear our prayers as we cry them out to you. Lord, we cry out desperately, honestly, selflessly. Lord, I pray we wouldn't just worship in the way we want. We would worship in the way you demand, in spirit and in truth. Draw us into your presence, Lord. Draw us into the fire of purification, Lord, so that we don't have to face the consuming fire, the judgment fire. Lord, make us more like you, more like Moses. Forgive me, Lord, for moments that I was more like Aaron than Moses. Forgive us, Lord, for choosing to sin at times. Forgive us for not crying out in prayer more, more desperately, more honestly, more selflessly. But I pray we would fear you, not because you're mean, but because you're awesome. And Lord, we would trust your goodness in our need, Lord. We cry out to you now. I pray we would meet with you in this room, whether it's at the communion table or in our hearts and minds before we walk out the door. Change us, I pray. In Jesus. Jesus, we pray.